Hello and welcome to the 1800 Respect webinar today. I'm Carla Rogers and I have the pleasure of welcoming you. Um, so the webinar is about access to justice for migrant and refugee women impacted by violence. And we're exploring the experiences, the barriers and the national framework to improve accessibility to Australian courts. Thanks for joining us. It's terrific to have you here. On our, um, our webinar today is being presented in Sydney and Melbourne, and we're on the traditional lands of the Eora and Kulin nations. And we wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners and pay our respects to elders, past and present, and the elders from other communities who may be present today. 1800 Respect is a confidential information, counselling and support service that is open 24 hours every day of the year. And it supports people impacted by sexual assault, domestic or family violence and abuse. People can access the service by phoning 1800 737 732 or visiting 1800respect.org.au. Today's 1800 Respect webinar and we'll discuss some key issues impacting on access to justice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, including barriers to reporting family violence, communication barriers and barriers to full participation in the court process. The webinar will also provide um, with us with some strategies to improve access to justice and uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and women impacted by violence. Please note that the webinar is live, it's interactive and you can enter your questions and we'll try to answer as many of them at the, as possible at the end of the presentation. A quick introduction to our um, wonderful presenters today. We have um, Magistrate Anne Goldsborough from the Magistrates' Courts of Victoria. Um, Magistrate Goldsborough will provide some context regarding the establishment and work of the Di Judicial Council on Cultural Diversity. She'll discuss the national consultations that took place in 2015, resulting in the report, The Path to Justice, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Women's Experience of the Courts. She will also talk about the national framework to improve accessibility to Australian courts for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and migrant and refugee women. Manya Andrews is a senior Indigenous barrister and also um, my co-director at Evolve Communities. Manya will speak about the barriers to access to justice experienced by many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women who have been impacted by violence, including barriers to reporting violence, communication barriers and barriers to full participation in court. She will also speak about some of the actions that courts, judges and other stakeholders can take to break down these barriers and improve access to justice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. A warm, very warm welcome to you both. It's now my pleasure to hand over to Magistrate Goldsborough to start the... Good morning. I apologise for that. Uh, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which uh, we meet and this presentation is occurring today and also across Australia and pay my respects to elders and custodians past and present. Thank you for inviting me to talk with you about the work of the Judicial Council on Cultural Diversity uh, and I've been a member of that council uh, since it commenced. So we know why Australia is one of the most ethnically, and culturally and linguistically diverse communities uh, in the world. And in addition to our rich indigenous culture, Australia is a nation built on migration. According to the latest ABS census, um, these are startling figures in my view and ones that we should always recall. Nearly 650,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people live in Australia. That's around 3% of the population. Nearly 7 million Australians were born overseas. That's around 28% of our population. And there are over 300 languages, including Indigenous languages, spoken in Australian households. The diversity has benefited Australia enormously, both economically, social terms, um, and however, it's also created challenges in many aspects of our community and our society, which of course includes 
the justice system and access and equality of access to it for all. The First Nations people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, have a singular place in Australia. However, the sad history of dispossession and social exclusion um, experienced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over generations has contributed to their likely over-representation in the criminal justice system. It also is almost every other measure of social and economic disadvantage. We acknowledge the justice system should recognise, uh, understand and respond to the needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, people and the people of culturally and linguistically diverse communities. More broadly, meaning we'll have access to justice for all. Some of my technical skills may be on display here, sadly. I apologise to all of you. Now, in 2014, the Council of Chief Justices of Australia uh, and New Zealand agreed to form the Judicial Council on Cultural Diversity, or the JCCD, to provide advice to them and to courts to better recognise, understand and respond to the, to the access to justice needs for culturally diverse Australian communities. The Council of Chief Justices comprises Chief Justices of the High Court, the Federal and Family Courts, the Supreme Courts of each of the states and territories, together with the Chief Justice of New Zealand. That is a good bunch of people. The fact that this body recognised the need and supported the establishment of the JCCD is significant and critical for our courts and justice. The JCCD's purpose included developing frameworks to support um, procedural fairness and equality of treatment for all court users regardless of their race, colour, religion, national or ethnic origin, and to promote public trust and confidence in Australian courts and the judiciary. The current chair of the JCCD is the Chief Justice of South Australia, and I acknowledge our past chair, the former Chief Justice of Western Australia. The members of the JCCC are drawn predominantly from the judiciary and selected representation from legal um, and community bodies as well. Members are selected to balance both gender and court level. I'm the representative from Victoria and I'm one of uh, a few ma only two magistrates. Manya and I are both honoured to be current members of the JCCD. Now, in March 2015, the Judicial Council received funding from the uh, Commonwealth Office of Women to undertake a project to strengthen the capacity of Australian courts to provide access to justice for women face facing cultural and linguistic challenges. We recognised on the JCCD the additional vulnerability and access challenges for uh, cold women having to enter the justice system, often as a result of family violence or family breakdown, so we focused our project accordingly. The first stage of the project involved national consultations, a very important part of that, Separate consultations were held for issues affecting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and separately again for migrant and refugee women. These two projects uh, went along together. The first stage of the project involved the national consultations and um, that was um, a very big endeavour, I must say, across Australia. As part of the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander consultation process, the JCCD held consultation roundtables and one-on-one -on -one meetings with a wide range of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled services and other groups who work directly with these women experiencing violence. Stakeholders, so-called, uh, included legal services, domestic violence services, health services and also researchers. There were two very clear messages that we received. The abiding need recognise the special place of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women in the First Nations people and to ensure that the needs of these women are met at the outset uh, and their importance is truly acknowledged. We need to also understand the potential complexity of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and cultures. And the barriers in accessing justice vary greatly depending on location, age, language and community. <clears throat> You'll see that report there and that's what it looks like if you go to our website and I recommend that you download it if you can. The focus of the consultations was on women's experience of the court system and the actions that courts themselves could 
take to improve access to justice. And this is an extremely important message. The findings from these consultations were compiled and documented in our report, which you'll see on your screen. As anticipated, the consultations identified a number of barriers that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women face when they reach court, and also it was a clear finding there were a number of barriers to these women faced before they ever reach the court or seek legal support. And these barriers result in them failing to seek help through the justice system at all. And that is a failing. Another key message was the need to recognise that family violence invariably involved adult victim and child victims and overwhelmingly women. Some of the barriers um, that affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women exclusively, why others that are issues that impact on all women experiencing family violence. However, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women may experience these bar barriers sorry, more acutely, of course, because of past trauma, racism, adversity, disadvantage, language barriers, cultural difference and social exclusion. The key uh, barriers to justice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women are those on the screen. Barriers to reporting family violence, even to police, family, friends, doctors, um, any social services, communication barriers and barriers to full participation in courts. And of course that involves varying responses from those when attending police, courts or other services. You can read about these in the Path to Justice report which can be accessed on our website and I encourage you to do so. Now we're honoured to have Manya Andrews uh, to talk to us through some of these barriers also from her knowledge and experience. Okay, barriers to accessing uh, justice for um, Indigenous women. Um, factors such as intergenerational trauma and um, experiences of discrimination, racism and poverty all form a key part of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women's experiences. Um, any efforts to improve access to justice uh, to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women affected by violence um, must be underpinned by a far greater understanding of the impact of trauma and racism and the impact of this on their contact within the justice system. Trauma um, experienced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women arises from the forced removal of children and the loss of land, language and culture. It also arises from the burden of adversity experienced by um, many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, including uh, trauma um, arising from racism, uh, ill health, poverty, uh, injury, suicide, substance, uh, substance abuse, grief, loss and violence. It's important um, to realise that for many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women that their entire world feels unsafe. While a woman's world may be violent and unsafe, it is the only world she knows, unfortunately. For her, there is no safe place anywhere um, on earth. Uh, added to this, the experience of racism uh, not only has an impact on the physical and mental health of these women, but also undermines their confidence in, in the institutions such as the police and the justice system. So Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women's inclination uh, to involve the justice system, particularly in response to family and domestic violence, uh, is intimately connected with, with child protection. Now, right across Australia, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women um, do not report violence um, for lots of reasons, but mainly because they're scared that they're going to lose their children. Um, some women uh, keep their prob problems to themselves until the situation escalates to extreme violence, where acute options such as removal of children by child protection uh, authorities and prosecution uh, oh, sorry, and prosecution of violent partners really are sometimes the only options. This fear reflects both uh, historical and contemporary circumstances. 
The legacy of, of past removal policies was highlighted in the findings of the 1997 Australian inquiry into the separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children uh, from their families. There are, there are serious concerns at times um, about the way that police in particular respond to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women experiencing violence. Some police behaviour is perceived as discriminatory, uh, lacking cultural competence and at times uh, displaying a, a poor understanding of the cycle of domestic violence. Some people talk about a police culture of blaming the victim um, and a reluctance by police to intervene early. I've also heard of instances of uh, police treating women uh, dismissively, sending women home saying it wasn't a, a good enough breach, um, or responding to complaints with, a, with an attitude of, well, you know, you've asked for it. Some people um, are concerned um, that matters are not fully investigated by the police, um, that other witnesses are not interviewed, and that uh, statements are sometimes taken when uh, police are, well, sorry, when people are intoxicated. Pressure from their family also and, and the community can result in a reluctance to seek legal assistance. And we see this time and again with Indigenous women. Uh, for example, there's a fear that um, reporting family violence could result in having to move away from extended family and community, community to move away from their support networks. This would potentially separate the woman and um, any children from their social, cultural uh, and economic world. In some cases too, there may also be a fear of retribution, feelings of shame or guilt um, or kinship cultural obligations um, that make an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander woman uh, reluctant to report violence. A significant barrier for some Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women accessing the legal system is the distance involved. Uh, some courts have uh, very limited geographical reach and women may need to travel many hours, include, including more than a day, to attend court. Uh, these challenges are often compounded by um, the practical difficulties of not having a car or licence, um, money for travel or accommodation, or someone to look after their children uh, if they travel to court. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women living on communities uh, near state borders or where there is family movement across jurisdictions can have particular difficulties engaging with the justice system. Women in these locations um, at times engage with domestic and family violence, child protection and youth uh, justice authorities in several states. At times there may be a child protection orders and youth justice orders in place um, on each side of, of the border or siblings separated with some children removed by one jurisdiction and the other siblings removed by another state. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women um, often face more complex legal problems. Uh, some women may experience um, a wide range of criminal, administrative and uh, civil law issues family law, uh, domestic violence, child protection matters and housing tenancy matters are frequently interrelated and the interaction between these different spheres of law are not well understood. A, a common issue reported in the Northern Territory and Western Australia was for women to seek help with a violence matter and then be served with uh, unpaid fines or subpoenaed for other uh, offences, sometimes <laughs> resulting in jail terms, which can then result in their children uh, being removed. Several major inquiries have found that uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, as well as other Australians, have a high unmet need for community legal assistance. Funding cuts seriously affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women's access to justice, particularly in rural and remote communities because of the limited time that services were able to, to spend in the community. And this causes many women to find that really their only option uh, is to represent themselves. 
In addition, uh, legal services are frequently unable to provide legal advice or representation to women uh, due to a conflict of interest arising from past or current interactions with the perpetrator. Again, this is a particular concern in regional and remote areas serviced by only one or two community legal services. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women often have poor familiarity with family law and its uh, pr processes and their legal rights in relation to child protection. Also, some Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women don't appreciate the value of early advice or representation. And what additionally, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women experience many difficulties in their dealings with child protection authorities and courts about children. Many women uh, in contact with the child protection system do not realise that child protection actions occur within a legislative framework, no, nor do they seek legal assistance uh, for child protection matters. Uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women often seek legal advice only after substantial intervention by child safety agencies, including other children uh, that have already been removed. Women uh, have reported that child protection agencies sometimes put significant pressure on victims of family violence to remove themselves and their children uh, from the presence of their partner or to take action in court against the perpetrator. If, if they do not, the agencies soon take action to remove the children to, uh, from the mother's care. Difficulty understanding court processes, including uh, communication difficulties, can trigger and amplify women's existing fear and distrust uh, of the court system. Many Aboriginal and Torres Strait women uh, have trouble uh, communicating in the language of the justice system. Communication barriers can be experienced by speakers of Indigenous languages and also uh, by some women who speak Aboriginal English at home. Language barriers adversely impact on um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women's ability to deal with police, engage with support services, including legal representation, and communicate with court staff and uh, judicial officers. Women with limited English uh, language skills are at a distinct disadvantage when participating in court proceedings and understanding court orders. Different ways of communicating can affect the way that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women are heard and understood in the legal process, including how juries and judicial officers assess their credibility and reliability. Uh, difficulties in communicating also uh, adversely impact women's experience of the court system, heightening, uh, their, credi um, heightening their anxiety and mistrust. In addition to being uh, stressed about appearing in court and, and frightened by being near violent partners, women are further uh, stressed by not understanding what's happening and by the fear of not being understood. For Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women uh, with limited English language skills, the provision of professional, appropriate and skilled interpreters is crucial if the legal system is to respond to their needs and ensure that they can uh, participate fully in court proceedings. Um, however, the availability of interpreters remains an issue in a number of states and territories. The lack of Indigenous interpreters particularly uh, affects magistrates, courts, uh, tenancy and guardianship tribunals, police and child protection authorities. The observation has been that the lack of access to interpretation renders the justice system unjust, that without the um, interpreters, um, clients are not able to fully understand the caution uh, they, uh, or to participate in police interviews or provide English statements. to give instructions, to uh, understand charges, to uh, engage in processes associated with court records, for example, uh, pre-sentencing or psychiatric reports um, especially. 
for Aboriginal and yeah, sorry, we're just having problems here. Just hit the slide. Um, another related issue is in in is the lack of clarity really about who is ultimately responsible for determining when a client needs an interpreter and when to stop proceedings if an interview if if an interpreter is not available. Sorry. Um, an ongoing issue is the failure of police, uh, council, and courts to use interpreters with the objective of, you know, getting through the list, overriding the obligation to engage interpreters. There have been um, occasions when judicial officers and lawyers recognise that interpreters are needed, but continue um, legal processes despite knowing the litigant does not understand what is happening. This is um, partly to do with an absence of processes to assess the need for an interpreter in advance of, an, of a hearing, especially when uh, women are um, un, unrepresented. This issue really is magnified in the, in the case of remote uh, circuit courts with magistrates and counsel flying in and out of communities, and there is a pressure to complete lists in short time frames. There is a lack of, um, of a consistent awareness or competence among judicial officers and lawyers of, of how to work with interpreters. Uh, counsel and judicial officers uh, would benefit from training and professional development in this area, including how to assess uh, if an interpreter is needed, uh, skills on working with speakers of Aboriginal English especially, uh, practical skills on working with an interpreter, and um, how to speak in plain English. Courts are, um, are often seen by Aboriginal and Torres Strait women as potentially unsafe and not as a place to seek resolution for problems. Um, I won't go through um, each of these examples now. You have them there on the slide. But as you can see, there are a, a range of factors about the court experience that can pose barriers for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, including the intimidating process of arriving at court um, and safety while they're waiting at court, uh, the unpredictable waiting times, uh, difficulty understanding forms, uh, charges, orders or judgments, and even the courtroom dynamics. Um, difficulty understanding the court processes, including communication difficulties, can be triggered and, and amplified by some women's existing fear and mistrust or distrust of, of the court. All of these barriers mean that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women often experience far higher levels of violence. Um, sorry, we've just lost. Far higher levels of, of violence over far longer periods of time before they approach the justice system and more likely to drop out of the process on the way. Yeah, over to you now, Anne. So just uh, outlining Thanks, the issues there for Indigenous women. Yeah. Thank you. As you'll see, uh, for many of you who are watching this webinar, um, the items so carefully identified by Manya uh, are not new, but uh, the skill and, in my view, the importance of the work done by the Judicial Council is identifying them and drawing them into a document to assist courts to have an authoritative way of identification and hopefully consistent application. To that end, there is some other work of the Judicial Council, including um, the National Framework to, to improve accessibility, which I'll talk to you. And uh, there is also a major piece of work on interpreters and uh, the application and process for assessment of need, which uh, hopefully on another occasion we'll be able to talk to you about, because I think uh, personally that's an incredibly important piece of work by the Judicial Council. I'll go here to um, the framework. So of course, four courts, having identified what the issues are for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, and of course the Corolli report uh, in relation to cold women, courts um, been uh, in many of them for many years that uh, we need a framework as to how to roll that out consistently. And um, so, as I say, Manya has also reflected very strongly on the feedback that we have uh, received. Um, 
The JCCD has taken, of course, this information very seriously and this framework document is on your screen. It's a national approach for courts to improving this access to justice and achieving equality before the law for women of culturally and linguistically diverse background, particularly in the context of family violence and family breakdown, as I outlined at the outset. It is an aspirational set of principles and best practice guidelines for Australian courts federal, state and territory, um, all levels um, to implement and take action to improve access. The focus on the framework is on adapting court policies, procedures and resources and a key objective is to promote um, higher public trust and confidence in Australian courts and of course consequently the judiciary. Um, it's been endorsed by the Council of Chief Judges and had an official launch in Canberra last year. On your screen you'll see the principles. It's based on the core values to which of course all Australian courts should strive. These core values guarantee equal protection for the law for those who come before the courts. Whilst all of these values are important, the key value underpinning the national framework is the achievement of equal justice for all court users regardless of their sex, race, religion, language, national or ethnic origin. Equal justice means that all people, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, are able to understand and be understood in legal proceedings and have sufficient awareness and understanding of the role of the justice system, how courts work and what protections the law can offer them. Equal justice also means that courts dispense justice free from unconscious bias, of course, and discrimination, and that proceedings are fair and impartial, our major core work. Judicial officers, court staff, police prosecutors and legal profession, lawyers and court report writers in all jurisdictions should have a level of cultural awareness and I would add competence around the challenges and barriers faced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women seeking justice and access to the system. An understanding of the uh, gendered uh, inequality and gendered violence is vital to ensure that judicial officers and courts, lawyers, report writers can respond appropriately to the needs of women appearing before them in family violence related matters, all related matters, family law matters and recognise the difficulties women may be faced in engaging with that system. In relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women this requires an appreciation in my view that they may have a legacy uh, in the past of trauma and may have experienced a lifetime of institutional discrimination, making them reluctant to be part of the system. Now the framework for courts draws on seven action areas uh, from the International Framework for Court Excellence as potential areas for uh, change. Court leadership and management. Uh, leadership from the judicial officers and court administrators combined is essential in demonstrating a court's commitment to providing equal justice and equal access to justice for migrant and refugee women and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. Court planning and policies should develop a clear plan and strategies to implement the national framework and improve access to justice. And there are um, uh, people in all courts who've taken on this responsibility. Court resources, um, that's both human, material and financial. And in relation, the courts need to understand the communities around them because of course they are all different um, that they're serving and steps taken to help uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women navigate the court system. The court proceedings and processes, well many of those of course are fixed as uh, some of you may appreciate. Um, there are rules, there's legislation that we need to abide by. But processes can be adjusted and they need to be fair effective and efficient and it's essential that all court users understand the processes and are, they are participating in. Client needs and satisfaction and that's something that courts uh, haven't, shall I say, broadly uh, um, encountered or undertaken in the past. But this is a recommendation in the framework and essentially a prerequisite to tackling the barriers by diverse communities in interaction is to better understand what's happening outside our court. Um, to ensure an effective flow of relevant information between court staff and administrators and judicial officers 
what are the needs of court users with respect to whether an interpreter is necessary, for example. Affordable and accessible court services, um, there are many ways these can be enhanced, including through forms, brochures and resources, legal support, um, documents. I've prepared many at my local court, which hopefully can go some way to reducing this. Um, also, public trust and confidence, which I hope is the appropriate by product appeared um, from the screen. And a key objective of this framework is to promote higher public trust and confidence in the court system. And we do need to demonstrate uh, that we are aware of these things. To simplify, we've grouped the framework's proposed actions under three themes that you'll see on your screens community engagement and public information, logistic support and coordination, and judicial education or professional development. While these recommended actions are aimed at courts and judicial officers in particular, we also feel it's good for others to be aware of what courts already are trying to implement and to improve access to justice. I think you'll acknowledge there are some excellent programs and work underway already in many courts across uh, Australia. Again, the recommendations are all within the framework, which you can, of course, access from the JCCG website. Manya will now talk us through some of the key strategies, as she sees them, for improving equal access to justice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women impacted by violence. Thanks, Manya. To build trust and understanding um, relationships uh, building between judicial officers and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities sometimes need uh, years and takes a, lo a long time. Uh, real community engagement is a two-way uh, learning process with profound benefits for both judicial officers and communities. Now, some strategies for engagement may include uh, things like open days and tours, uh, for service providers and community organisations to make courts more accessible to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. Uh, community education forums and education sessions for women from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities uh, um, and migrant and refugee women, of course, on specific issues or court processes. Uh, regular meetings or, or court user forums with key stakeholders including especially the Indigenous justice groups, and just uh, regular community visits programs, um, celebrating days of significance, uh, such as uh, NAIDOC, the anniversary of the Apology, National Sorry Day, Reconciliation Week, and uh, Oka Ribbon Day. Uh, developing and maintaining court forms and pro um, brochures on their services in plain English, that, that's really important and a resource list on relevant issues for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, including uh, legal services, victim assistance services, uh, domestic and fa family violence services, and housing and financial support. There are a number of ways uh, in which courts, uh, premises and process can be improved to make courts more accessible for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. Uh, courts uh, should consider uh, improving their signage and information available upon arrival at court, including um, translating a signage into community languages with high Aboriginal and um, Torres Strait Islander populations. All courts uh, should consider investing in security and safety measures to ensure all court buildings are a safe environment for women. Uh, courts uh, should... Uh, Seek to improve data collection about the cultural, linguistic and gender diversity of their court users and also their satisfaction with the court experience. Such inf information would assist courts to ensure that they are responsive to the needs of their users and enable the courts to tailor their responses in particular to the needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. It would be beneficial in magistrates' courts for staff to hold a daily coordination meeting uh, before hearings begin in a family violence list to allow priority to be given to high-risk cases to ensure that uh, interpreters are available and to prioritise the list accordingly. 
uh, to liaise with legal rep representatives to manage conflicts and to liaise with um, applicant and respondent uh, support workers. The proposed actions around judicial educations are consistent with the feedback from the 2015 consultations and also with my broad experience. Uh, there is a need for greater access to training and material that provides cultural context to judicial officers. Areas uh, for su suggested attention include the dynamics of uh, domestic and fa family violence, uh, trauma, especially intergenerational trauma, uh, unconscious bias, cultural awareness, a greater understanding of local communities and their specific cultural practices, a plain English communication and working with interpreters. There is a strong case for having training delivered by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people where possible and tailor it to the local circumstances. So over to you, Anne. Thanks, Manya. And, and I very much agree with those uh, matters outlined. So as you can see, there's a lot of work to be done with some good work already well underway. Um, there are bench books and training is already uh, being rolled out in some areas. Um, the challenge now is how we can best implement the proposed actions in the framework to improve access to justice in a real way for Indigenous women and migrant and refugee women in Australia across all levels of state, federal courts, territory courts, Children's and Magistrates Courts, Family Courts, District, County and Supreme Courts. As we know that family violence is present in every one of those courts as presented to us as judicial officers. Members of the JCCD and Court Cultural Diversity Champions met in October last year to workshop implementation of the framework, to prioritise the things courts and judicial officers personally and as a group can do in the short and medium term to improve access to justice for women uh, from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and of course our cold communities. Um, we are meeting again in October. We look forward to hearing your views on how best we can work with you and other key stakeholders to improve access to justice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women in Australia in all our courts and tribunals because if we work together this will happen. Thank you. There will be some questions that I think Manya and I Will will attempt to respond to for you. Mm. Would you like me to go to those two now, Manya? Yeah. Um, um, I can see one that uh, is on the top of the screen in relation to interpreters, and I know I touched mm -hmm. on that, and it is a key challenge, not only in availability of professional interpreters mm -hmm. in the diversity of languages required how easily accessible they are. Um, but we do know there are also challenges in many of our communities, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and cold communities, of knowledge of family and who the interpreter mm. is. Um, if you go to the Judicial Council of Cultural Diversity's website, you'll see the uh, national uh, framework for standards of interpreters that are recommended for courts. And essentially it is a series of um, principles and policies for professionalisation of interpreters and of course how best they can be used. We have been preparing some materials for training for judicial officers and also interpreters. It is a challenge and I think it's important that courts uh, consider that when an interpreter arrives and understands that they have a duty to faithfully interpret. And certainly they're matters that I deal with in court. Um, I would never use a family member. Um, unless it was absolutely desperate in the short term, um, but it's not to be desired. Um, and that's one of the first ones. I'm not sure if that's a good enough answer, but I hope that we might be able to present you with some more material about interpreters uh, in due course. Um, the others I think are too, I think one of the other issues too, Anne, is um, um, we, we know that you need uh, interpreters for specific languages, but um, I, um, I think there's a great need to think about interpreters of Aboriginal English as well, which is fully fledged um, language in itself. And um, because I see, many, and this is not about uh, 
having proficiency of uh, English or not enough English. This is about um, needing um, interpreters for people who speak Aboriginal English. It's a it's a language of its own, and um, that that um, there is a great I find that there is a great need in the courts to address this issue as well, that just around good. interpreters. Very important. And um, fortunately, um, Manya and I have worked together on a bit of uh, professional development for judicial officers, and I think that's uh, something that I would like to um, do something with you again, uh, Manya, if we can, in Victoria next year, yes. um, on yes. just these issues. Um, exactly. We need to know it, and our staff need to know it, the lawyers need to know it, and if everybody has this knowledge, then it won't be left to one section of the community. Yes. I think it's a joint venture. Mm. Yes, for sure. Mm. I'm just looking at some of the questions. Questions. Um, mm -hmm. How long does it take? Well, how long is a piece of string? <laughs> um, on the basis we all work together, we have to, I think, seek incremental change. In my view, I've been a magistrate for nearly 22 years and I was involved in the family courts prior to that. I see this as a massive change. The fact that the consultations have occurred, the fact it's now documented that there are recommendations and a framework for implementation auspiced by such an authoritative body such as um, the Council of Chief Justices um, who take recommendations um, from the Judicial Council, this is a massive step forward. It makes it easier for courts to try and make um, decisions that are consistent and consistent with each other in each state, federally and, uh, and locally. Um, so it's my view we all have to work together to get the courts and our administrators to take this on board and implement it a step at a time. As long as we're moving forward, I see it as significant progress. Manya, are there other questions you see there? Oh, um, okay. So um, how do you think we can improve staffing and expertise, especially for rural and remote communities? Um, any ideas there, Anne, about how we can improve that? Well, improve staffing, I, I think, can I go back to specialisation? Um, mm -hmm. I probably have a practice as a specialist family violence magistrate and have been involved with the Law Reform Commissions in that regard. Um, specialisation is the key. It's, uh, it's understanding, it's then application and specialisation of all elements of um, the system. So that's judicial officers, court staff, lawyers, um, police prosecutors, police. And across Australia we see some pockets, in my view, of excellent determined development. Um, do I think that it's perfect? You know nothing is ever perfect, unfortunately. But we have to move forward. We need to support the champions, support those who undertake a leadership role um, to improve and, and just promote consistent best practice every day. Um, we need to have um, community engagement to learn. It's working with people like Manya that I have been so um, grateful to learn more each time we work together or I work with others. We need to expose ourselves to other ideas and in my view, judicial officers do that strikingly well, despite what some might say might have some loud voices in the community. Um, every judicial officer I know wants to do the right thing. Um, they want to do the right thing consistently. And I think these yeah. sorts of uh, frameworks can help people move in the right direction. Um, our champions across Australia are responsible for taking this work back to our courts. It, it can be, it's always work done outside our daily uh, every day sitting in court, but there are many very dedicated people determined for this change, what I would say from, from this side of the bench. Manu, I wonder what you think about it. Of improving, you yeah. That, <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I think I think you've hit, hit the nail on the head, and it's about community engagement and building partnerships and relationships with people in the community and um, especially the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, um, that, that that support comes from there as well. And, and it's spreading that education um, um, among themselves. It's, it's, a, it's a 
two-way education process. Um, magistrates, court workers learn from Indigenous people and Indigenous people learn from, from magistrates and uh, court workers and that. So um, definitely um, community engagement is, is the key. Um, yeah. I think, um, I think it's important that communities understand the way courts work. Um, when we talk about access to justice, there are things that we can change, moderate, improve, um, try to do differently, ensure it's consistent, ensure specialised practice is involved. But courts um, are institutions that uh, live within a framework of rules and the law, and it's, it's how we apply it is the principles that we're talking about here. Um, so I think it does help when communities come in and understand the way it works. Years ago we developed, for example, a walk in her shoes tour, which was by talking to some of my registrar um, people I worked with in, in Melbourne a long time ago. And we now, think we now have people come to the court to see what it's like to arrive at court, make an application for an intervention order, go through the system, and they can go back and explain, this is for workers and support workers and teachers and kindergarten people, um, to see what it's like to apply for an intervention order, to understand the system, to go back and speak to people about how it works. Um, and you know, the introduction of the morning meeting has been a key feature of my specialist courts for years because I don't go, but the staff and the lawyers and the police um, can look at a list and try and coordinate and ensure an interpreter's there. There may be some incredibly high risk matters that need some priority for legal advice. It's everybody has a part in trying to get the best outcome is the way to proceed. Manira, there's some other questions that you see there. I um, there's a yes. Uh, I think there's one, there's one there from Hannah. Um, how, as support staff, can we use this framework to educate magistrates and DV specialist courts who have been seen to speak poorly to the Aboriginal women we are supporting? Um, uh, just offhand, I was thinking just straight away, obviously that speaks to the need of more um, cultural uh, uh, awareness or cultural competency training um, for magistrates. I know a number are undertaking these and um, I, I've been involved in that from um, over the years um, through, through time. Um, it's about spreading that message. Um, I think um, making um, them aware, yeah, aware that the, the framework exists and to um, uh, for, for, for um, people to educate themselves about all of those barriers that I, that I spoke about. Um, but again, that communication one is 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 a really important one. Um, uh, it, it, it's a hard one to get around without the cultural awareness training for people to be aware of the different ways in which indigenous people especially communicate. And um, you know they they're quite pr quite pronounced from the the lack of direct um, eye contact to speaking in a softer voices uh, to who gets to speak and, 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 and particularly some reluctance, cultural reasons for um, about speaking to people in positions of authority, which of course magistrates are. So it's, um, uh, that's just off, offhand what I'm thinking about. Um, Anne, can you think of anything else? How, how um, magistrates can, or court workers can use this framework? To... Well, I think understand the framework. I do go yeah. back to um, my point that um, specialised practice is key. Um, I think the appreciation of difference is also important for judicial officers. When we talk about judicial independence, um, that is an independence in relation to my decision making um, and all judicial officers' decision making. So. Um, Courts across Australia have broadly embraced, in my view, judicial education or professional development. And we know that the community is made up of all sorts of different people. And even though the numbers of judicial officers are relatively quite small, the sense of obligation and determination and hard work, in my view, displayed 
um, by judicial officers broadly is important to acknowledge. So again, I say that I don't know any who want to make the wrong decision or say anything that's inappropriate on purpose. Um, but I know I'm sure that from time to time I've said things that were perhaps misguided, misunderstood. Um, I'm being candid here to show you that it's about trying to be open, listen, reflect, have fabulous opportunities to work with other people, engage with the community, which is what these recommendations are. So um, sometimes there are things that everybody in the community says which may be inappropriate. And I think if we consider that judicial officers are just members of the community, you know, I have my dogs, my kids, all of those things, and we need therefore everybody to have this support and understanding of what's an inappropriate thing to say. Um, I accept that there are greater expectations from our judicial officers. We are fortunate and have a terrific job, um, which I like very much. And um, I appreciate that special position, but we are everyday members of the community, so let's focus on training everybody, providing education to everybody, not to make those mistakes. And um, Leslie Ann had, yeah, had a question. Um, that government That's one. W website that you um, mentioned, uh, that cold website, is that a government website, Anne? The... Uh, I think um, perhaps if you can go to the Judicial Council of Cultural Diversity and um, the JCCD. If you go to that website, it's uh, um, government, no, but it's also by the Migration Council and operated by the Migration Council. But if you type in Judicial Council of Cultural Diversity, you'll find all of these things. And I think there's a question where uh, Hannah's asked, will you see the Murray courts? In this space, um, yeah, specialist courts. Um, yeah, that that's the question. Um, well, I would have thought that was goes to that um, specialisation that you talked about, Anne. Um, um, I, I I think to some extent the Murray courts, the Koori courts, are uh, um, would would probably no doubt be aware of this framework, and um, if not, would would be aware of a number of all of those issues that we talked talked about. So it's just as applicable to, to them, them of course. Did you want to add anything to that, Anne? We've got to wind up now. Um, and we're, I, we're, I think we're, bearing in mind we have to wind up certainly. soon, so just a way to sure. close. Yes. I, I think there certainly uh, is the absolute appropriate place for um, specialist courts for our First Nations people. Um, and there are um, different ways of, of handling matters in courts, but um, I think the, the Murray Courts and the Koori Courts are exactly, uh, as Manya says, right there, they're specialist. And we all, they, this framework is applicable to them too, because not everything's perfect, but we want it to be. Thank you, everybody. Unless there's anything else? So we want to thank Anne and Manya for a fascinating presentation today. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Stephanie, Christine and the Judicial Council on Cultural Diversity for their support in organising today. Today's webinar is available on the 1800 Respect YouTube channel and very, uh, very soon and a case study will also be um, on the website as well. You'll receive a notification when that goes live and feel, please feel free to share it with anyone that you think will find it interesting. Don't forget to su subscribe to the 1800 Respect Frontline Workers Connect newsletter on the 1800 Respect website to find out about any upcoming events. So thanks again to uh, Manya and Anne and thanks to everyone today for tuning in. Thank you.